In a leafy cemetery just outside the centre of Rome lies the grave of the English poet John Keats. He is buried in a quiet corner hidden from the bustle of the city in which he died in 1821. He spent the last days of his life broken-hearted, desperately ill and concerned that he had failed in his quest to become one of the great English poets. He asked for his epitaph to read, Here lies one whose name was writ in water because he believed that his legacy would be washed away by time. So why was Keats buried here, over a thousand miles from home and beneath his own declaration that he was forgettable, unremarkable, a first-class failure? This video will cover the crucial elements of his life and legacy, from his personal troubles to his veneration as a key figure of the Romantic movement. The name John Keats has not been washed away at all. So meet Keats. Born in London in 1795, he grew little above five foot tall and was described to have auburn hair and large expressive eyes. He had a reputation for fighting at school, was loyal and sensitive by nature, and retained a sense of humour in spite of great personal woe. Almost every aspect of his life was riddled with tragedy. First, his family was plagued by a series of misfortunes. By the time that Keats had turned 15, his brother Edward had died during infancy, his father had perished in a riding accident, and his mother had been lost to tuberculosis, a contagious disease that was commonly known as consumption and that was little understood at the time. The disease typically attacks the lungs, causing the victim to cough blood, grow skeletal and pale, and suffer from feverish sweats. In 1818, consumption also claimed the youngest of Keats's brothers, Tom. The same year had already seen the family disperse when George emigrated to America to etch out a new life as a businessman. Keats thus watched almost all of his immediate relatives move to a far away part of the world, or out of the world, altogether. Yet Keats was not only beset by familial difficulties, but by professional ones. He racked up enormous bills training to become a doctor, only to dedicate his life to poetry instead. The trouble was that his poetry was not particularly well received. Although Keats was admired by a handful of supporters, his work was ripped apart in some of the most eminent periodicals of the day. A particularly scathing review described Endymion as unintelligible, diffuse, tiresome and absurd, and Keats and his friends were mocked as the Cockney school of poetry. They were not from the upper classes of society or the hallowed halls of Oxbridge, and were sneered at as uncouth upstarts. As a derided poet struggling to make ends meet, Keats was not exactly prime husband material. He fell desperately in love with his neighbour Fanny Braun, a realist with a feisty wit, a flirtatious strain and a taste for fashionable clothes. By the end of 1819, the two were engaged, but their marriage was little more than a pipe dream. Braun was expected to find a husband with the monetary means to support her, and Keats was not in a position of financial stability. And he never would be. Like his mother and brother before him, Keats fell victim to consumption. He travelled to Rome in the vain hope that the warm weather would salvage his health, but to no avail. He died at the age of 25, having seen his relatives pass away, his work condemned by the critics, and his prospects of marriage blasted. The year before, he had written the following in a letter to Braun. If I should die, I have left no immortal work behind me, nothing to make my friends proud of my memory but I have loved the principle of beauty in all things, and if I had had time, I would have made myself remembered. So did anything positive come out of all this misery? Well, the events of Keats's lifetime helped to shape some of his most moving and enduring poetry. Although it would be reductive to read his work simply in biographical terms, there is no doubt that his life haunts his verse. Take Ode to a Nightingale, for instance, where the description of youth growing pale and spectre-thin echoes the effects of consumption that Keats witnessed firsthand. Or Lamia, where the references to classical mythology are piled on top of each other, as if Keats was keen to show himself equal to any Oxbridge-educated peer. The difficulties of Keats's life therefore appear to have impacted his poetry, poetry that is celebrated today as some of the finest in English literature. 
We now regard Keats as one of the key romantic poets. That's not romantic with a small r, as in Valentine's Day and Walks on the Beach, but romantic with a capital R, as in the wider movement known as Romanticism. This movement was a set of artistic, literary and intellectual tastes that swept across Europe, seemingly in a knee-jerk reaction to the Age of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment of the 18th century was about reason. It was a period in which science was popularised and rational thought was promoted as an alternative to religious dogma. The men of the Enlightenment sought to illuminate the mysteries of the universe. The Romantics, on the other hand, revelled in the mysteries. They detested the idea of squashing the world down into facts and equations, instead believing in the power of the imagination. They sought beauty for beauty's sake and desired to lose themselves in the natural world, in the ambiguous, majestic, transcendent. These qualities are reflected in Keats's poetry. Alongside Byron and Percy Shelley, he is known as a second generation romantic poet, the first generation consisting of William Wordsworth, Coleridge and Blake. It is important to note that none of these figures would have seen themselves as romantic poets, because the term is a retrospective one that we use to group together similar writers. In Keats's poetry, we find the sensual imagery of romanticism, and he even gave the movement one of its most famous maxims. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. If only he knew that one day those words would be found on anything, from mugs to t-shirts to classroom walls. To summarise, Keats was plagued by grief, criticism, heartbreak and ill health, yet from such misery came the beauty of his words. His poems drew upon the depth of feeling that he had experienced, and in doing so, those poems became part of the enduring legacy of Romanticism. In a flash of uncharacteristic faith and self-assurance, Keats had once written to his brother, I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. Although he came to believe that his name was writ in water, his younger self was closer to the mark. Keats's memory has been preserved in stone, in film, in paint, and even in this video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and look out for upcoming material on Keats's poetry. I promise to find a better pun than this one.